four million years later. Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends get together and watch an episode of the Transformers Generation 1 cartoon in story order and then convene to talk about what they saw. We are lifelong friends, been talking on the phone about Transformers for 25 years. We loved the show as children, loved it into our teens and our young adulthood, and now as not-so-young adults, we're finally recording these conversations where we look at the show again from the perspective of how we engaged with it as children and how we think about it now that we're all grown up. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... Day of the Hoover, I guess? I guess? I guess. <laughs> Are you setting the tone for this one already? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> not to spoil anything but I, I feel like that's the tone that you had when we were talking about this episode just before we started recording well, <laughs> i guess <laughs> there's a reason that we will soon learn yeah so day of the hoover i guess is my co-host name and the episode that we're talking about this week episode 25 of four million years later is day of the machines who wrote this one hoover this is by david wise and he previously wrote Attack of the Autobots. Mm, first, drain evil. Second, recharge good. That brilliant line came mm. from this guy. David Wise, who wrote a lot of really, I mean, like we mentioned that in Attack of the Autobots, but he he's, was a prolific writer. Yeah, he will go on to write a number of season two episodes and then skip over season three and do the rebirth, which is sort of season four. And if I'm not mistaken... David Weiss also wrote an episode of the Masters of the Universe cartoon called mm-hmm. Day of the Machines. Yeah. Huh. If only we had a Masters of the Universe expert on the show to talk about that. I tried calling Kevin Copa and James E. Talk, but neither of them could make it. So you're stuck with me, mm-hmm. Hoover. I'm sorry. Well, you're the expert I was referring to, so that's fine. Oh. <laughs> Moi? I like the show a lot, yes. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Transformers. So before we do the log line, let's go at 10,000 foot up view of this one. I anticipate we're going to have very different opinions on this episode, mm-hmm. um, partially because I have a very clear memory of watching this as a child. I remember uh, this is one of the episodes that I taped. And so obviously I watched it again and again. We talked about in our episode zero and our season one wrap up is that I had tapes and tapes and tapes of episodes from season two recorded. And when I would come home from school, I would just put them on in the background and lay on the living room floor and draw. And for some reason, I was given that time, even though I had 19 or 20 siblings. We're sure you've been asked, how many kids is too much? Three kids? Four? How about 69? Is that enough children? They, somehow they were okay with me like taking over the living room with like I would spread my drawings all over the floor, <laughs> lay on my stomach and draw and just have back to back episodes of the Transformers going on. So this one, I watched it multiple times and I think it has a lot of good stuff in it. There's a lot of weird stuff, but there's a lot of good things. Now, you don't have a clear memory of watching this as a kid. Am I right? You are correct. I probably did, but I don't really have any memory of it. And I think it, that'll become clear why today Mm. (laughs) but if you're looking for this on your little little tubi app if you use tubi tv to rewatch these you're going to find it in season two as episode 14 so Mm, thank you you want to watch along that's where that one is hiding because as we've said before the order we're doing these things in are not quite the same order as tubi has or as the dvds have or even as the script order. So we have a slightly modified order that we're going in. Oh my gosh, it's our head cannon. We finally mm-hmm. I finally have a head cannon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so let's let's kick into the, the log line for this episode. What's this episode about? From IMDB.com. Megatron reprograms the human built supercomputer Torque 3 with his own personality and has it controlling machines of all types by using remote control circuit linker cards. Oh, mm. that was all one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well done, IMDb. That was a long sentence. Yeah, so all types of machines. I wonder what that will mean. We'll discover as we get into it. So how does one open up? Well, we open up, and right away, Victor Caroli's here to set the scene. So let's let him do that. Midnight, Quantum Laboratories, well-guarded home of America's most secret scientific inventions. 
Oh, that's so good. Oh my gosh. Every time that guy shows up, it's like, get ready, kids. This is going to be intense. Yeah, it's really kind of a shame that they didn't make it like an automatic permanent thing for every episode. I think it would have brought a little something nice to it. I mean, not that every episode needs this sort of introduction, but Mm -hmm. I think it can benefit from it just because of the sound of that guy's voice. First recollection of this episode for me is I remember this one freaking me out in a lot of ways. Like there's a lot of like not only freaky imagery, but freaky ideas and and maybe some silly ideas. But like I I, I remember finding this one frightening and you hear that first line. It's like, okay, well, they're already teeing it up that way. I mean, Mm -hmm. it sounds like it sounds like like a a Canon films trailer is kicking (laughs) up with that scary voice. So so what do we see is is uh, Victor Crowley is frightening us. (laughs) So we pan around the outside of this sort of campus of buildings and the largest building has some rotating turrets on the roof. Mm. We start to pan into one of the windows of the building and we're taken into a room where we see three things on a desk, one of which is Soundwave's tape deck mode. And the other thing is a box and the third item is a guitar case. And we see a security guard enter the dark room. Shining a flashlight, he sees the three items and makes a comment about the absent-minded professors forgetting things and picks up the items to leave at the Lost and Found. And he drops them in a sort of cage that's labeled Lost and Found, and he leaves. <laughs> we focus on these items as the familiar tape deck launches out laser beak and then transforms himself. Soundwave then tosses a small key to Laserbeak, who catches it in his beak, and he instructs Laserbeak to release Megatron. And it turns out Megatron is in gun mode in the guitar case. And this is the only time we ever see Megatron shrink this small in gun mode in the show, as he usually only shrinks to Decepticon handgun size, not human handgun size. So then Megatron transforms to robot form as well, and instructs Soundwave to get a move on. He literally says, get a move on, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like a little bit uncharacteristic for Megatron. I mean, maybe he's like, well, it's just the three of us. It's just <laughs> casual. But I, I just have to say, I love that we don't get this that often in the series is I love that they're actually using disguise. Yeah. You know, like Soundwave uses disguise probably three or four times in the series in this mm-hmm. way. Right. Like we turn on your radio. That's not my radio. What is right. it? Yeah. But he's one of the very few. Yeah, like it almost never happens. And I love it. A, Megatron is sneaky again that way. So he's using his disguise mode for once. And I love that there's like this procedure to it where it's like Soundwave's like, hey, look, it, that key's, that keyhole's too small for my big fingers to do this. Mm-hmm. So I need to get somebody smaller involved. So Laserbeak has something to do, you know, mm-hmm. or maybe like Soundwave's like, well, Megatron likes you best. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, could, you could let him out. <laughs> but yeah, th- this whole scene is just like, it's worth underlining. I wish this would have happened more often in the series because it makes, you know, like so often in the series, Megatron just smashes through the wall, right? Literally. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you see scientists working and all of a sudden, boom, Megatron's in the room. Oh, yeah. Yep. This feels so much more menacing because he's like sneaking in in a guitar case. I don't know. So, but I guess the sneakiness isn't going to last very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blast from his fusion cannon gets them out of the lost and found, while Soundwave picks up the package that they had with them. And we then see the three outside trying not to be seen by some tanks on the property. The three fly through the air and land on the roof of one of the adjacent buildings. Laserbeak then blows a hole in the roof loudly, <laughs> explosively. Yeah. It seemed like stealth was priority, but okay. Yeah. So then Megatron and Soundwave hop down the convenient giant hole that Laserbeak just made as Megatron sees a computer screen with a big, ugly, pink face on it. The most powerful computer on this planet, So how do we know that this computer is powerful? Because it has a face. <laughs> There's a giant screen, probably twice the height of Megatron and Soundwave. And yeah. it has this pink face with yellow eyes. Megatron walks up to the very conveniently Decepticon scaled controls and says he'll re- reprogram it to serve only him. He starts pushing some buttons, and Torque 3 responds. Illegal access. Illegal access. It certainly is. Now you are being programmed with my personality, my instincts, my contempt for the weaklings who are denying me the ultimate greatness I deserve. 
it's interesting to talk about the design of Torque Three's face because, like you said, like it's a big, ugly, pink face, and it is. It's like it's like this implacable human-like face, but it's not fully human. It has all, like, all these fluorodary swooshes on it. The nose is literally a triangle that's like beveled out with like, like extra lines drawn on it. Mm-hmm. It looks kind of like like a human portrait as drawn by a Vulcan. Right, it, it seems distant and aloof and weird and odd, and it makes it feel futuristic. But for the purposes of what happens in this episode, I feel like they did a good job of designing something that seems unfriendly, detached, aloof, and somewhat alien because of what comes up, what happens next, and we can talk about that after what Megatron does, what he's what he does. So then, a sort of screwdriver comes out of Megatron's forehead and inserts <laughs> into a hole in the computer terminal. Copy evil, eight comma one. <laughs> and then we see Torque's face contort <laughs> while this occurs, ultimately culminating in Torque saying he's now Megatron's to command. Now, this is where careful watching pays off. If you go back and watch, you look at Torque's design pre-hacking versus post-hacking. He goes from being kind of like aloof and weird looking to like super distorted and evil looking. And all he did is just like emphasize a few different things. Like the eyes change a little bit, but the swooshes all remain there. The nose is still the same nose, but it's just like bulging out it like between the, the, the eyes just a little bit. And the frown is just like, like it's like a sort of um, an aloof frown before. And I wouldn't even say a frown. It's just more like it's like a non smile. And then it, like they turn the corners of the mouth down just enough so that like he becomes pretty scary looking at the end of the hacking you know and like this is one of those things like because like the the, when the face is getting all twisted on the screen it visually delivers what a violent act this is right like megatron is putting his personality to this computer right Mm -hmm. and then like to see how twisted the face is afterwards this is the kind of thing that made my little 11 year old brain go yikes (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they do it all visually right like it's all done just with what you see like if you listen to the sound it's there's not a whole lot going on there you just hear megatron doing his speech saying ah you're gonna have my personality my disdain for the autobots and then when he's done torque's like i'm yours to command master you know mm-hmm. but that face is freaky dude <laughs> well soundwave then hands megatron the box that they came in with and megatron opens it to find several little computer chip looking things As he walks around the room, we see numerous types of robotic vehicles like tanks with arms and metal whips. Some very (laughs) wheeled warriors kind of odd things. Wheeled warriors, quick changing fighting machine. Armed force, I'll disarm you. Yeah, they're kind of like like the pack rats from G.I. Joe, but like with Floro Dairy's Mm. influence where they're all smooth and swooshy looking versus the more angular kind of pack rats things. But that's essentially what they are, right? Mm-hmm. And so Megatron places one of these circuit things on one of these strange devices and instructs Torque to take command of the mechanism. It instantly roars to life and begins attacking Soundwave <laughs> until Megatron instructs it to stop. So Megatron is pleased with the performance and instructs Torque to place the remaining circuit thingies onto all the rest of the strange robo-tanks as the first tank comes over to do the job for him. So now Megatron will have an army of weird robo tanks at his disposal. Okay, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, the the, the uh, utility of this act is not very clear just yet. I guess you know having a whole bunch of like future tanks with whippy arms would be good, but the whippy arms like the, the strange nature of the vehicles that Megatron is having Torque take over, I think contributes to this weird kind of like phantasm ish kind of feeling that this episode had for me as a child because like while the the robots don't look like tremendously frightening they're weird they're weird Mm -hmm. looking right and so that's what's making everything feel like it's off kilter just a little bit now there's another thing there's another moment in this exchange between torque and megatron that as a child really affected me and i think we've talked about this in some past episodes is when the show used challenging language language that challenged my vocabulary as a child i would often run to the dictionary to find out what did they just say Mm -hmm. and i think there's something possibly kind of wrong with my brain because like when those lines happen like i only had to hear them once and they would be stuck in there and they just roll around again and again and again until i understood Mm -hmm. what they what they meant like and i think we talked about this in an episode of i think it was in our season one wrap-up maybe or maybe it was in episode zero but like sometimes these lines i don't fully decode what they actually meant until like 30 years later (laughs) but this line it's it's pretty straightforward but the language Language was complex enough and it, and it seemed so formal in the context of what was happening that it made me always feel like the show is always shooting just over my little 11 year old head 
Mm. And it goes back to this idea that the episodes that felt very grown up were the ones that I got really excited about as a little kid. And so this exchange is Megatron says, you know, Torque, what is the first action before engaging in an act of war? And Torque immediately responds, the preparation of defenses against enemy retaliation. You know, and the Megatron's like, very good, Torque. And that means put these circuit breakers all over all of these vehicles, right? So he's saying, like, we're about to engage in an act of war, so get your defenses ready. They could have found simpler, more quote unquote kid friendly language for that, but because they didn't. Like, mm. it made me go, like, okay, what what would that exchange mean? Rewind, listen again. Hmm? What, what was that? Okay, well, I'm going to have to, like, and I remember even asking, like, my parents, you know, like, what does that mean? With certain lines in the series. So, once again, this is my, this is Jersey's little soapbox to stand on to say, like, these guys were really trying to write effectively for children. And whenever you say it doesn't hold up to what? To your nostalgia? Okay, maybe that's something, but don't hold it unnecessarily next to other kinds of literature or film because it's apples and oranges. And it's also surprising to see what we reacted to as children at from the perspective of a grown-up who now writes for children. This is all very useful information for me as going forward and developing new stories. Anyway. I'm just stuck on thinking about you as a kid asking your parents, Dad, what is the first action before engaging in an act of war? <laughs> That was that was very much what I was like as a child. Yes. And I would say like, okay, so I heard this. And my dad be like, where did you hear that? You know, it's like, well, the TV said. <laughs> I'm starting to figure out why all your 42 siblings just left you alone and let you do whatever oh you want. Oh my gosh. Because you would ask them weird questions like this. You are probably so right. Like I was the less Nessman of my family. <laughs> well, what's that supposed to mean? You know, I'm turning to them and very earnestly asking these dumb questions. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, he's at it again. Stop watching the show that seriously. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So what happens next? Well, we cut to elsewhere, presumably on the same campus, where we see two scientists played by Ken Sansom, who does Hound, and Don Messick, who does Ratchet. And they're arguing about Torque 3 being too powerful. What if someone were to get control of it? You know, like what's happening meanwhile? (laughs) Well, the pro-torque scientist is singing its virtues, saying it's the first machine that can in turn create other machines and can produce such useful devices as remote control file cabinet openers, (laughs) which he then demonstrates. Yeah, that's so good. (laughs) And then noticing the time, he says they should both get home and get some sleep, but then the office door shuts on them. Mm -hmm. Unable to budge the locked door, they decide to call maintenance when suddenly Torque 3's face comes on their local PC. And Torque tells the first scientist, who is Dr. Paul Gates, that he has taken control of Quantum Labs now. And Gates springs into action to rebuild the Visophone. (laughs) <laughs> for long distance transmission in order to call for help. Now, if only iPhones would have been called Visaphones. <laughs> oh my gosh. Instead of FaceTime, this is called Visaphone. Uh, <laughs> also, I don't know if we've established who's playing Torque 3, but it sure sounds like Greg Berger's voice, like tweaked and modified. Mm. The great thing about today's free software is we can play around with it and have a listen and see what it sounds like modified. And, you know, we probably have better free software today than they had back then to make the show with. Yeah. So let's play around with that and see what it sounds like. See if it sounds like Greg Berger. Illegal access. Illegal access. Correct, boy wonder. All right. Paul Gates is using the Visiphone to call for help, which means the next scene is... Well, cut to not the Autobots receiving a distress call, but instead we're cutting to Megatron flying above the ocean with Rumble and Frenzy. Oh, that's cool. Hey! Looks like it might be sun up the following morning, perhaps, because it was night last we saw the campus of buildings. And they're now firing those circuit controller things onto a fleet of oil tankers below, allowing Torque to take control of them. Well, see, now that seems more advantageous instead Mm -hmm. of just taking over a bunch of Wild Warriors. So now we cut to Autobot HQ, where Teletran calls Prime over to note an unexplained change in oil tanker shipping patterns. I guess Teletran's just always monitoring everything. Yeah, well, you know what? Actually, I would, if we were to do like any theorizing about this, because a conversation we've had about the series so far is it's interesting that they have essentially living creatures with different kinds of cognition among them, right? You have Ravage, who is clearly smarter than a puma, 
or Jaguar rather, but is less than a Decepticon, like like Soundwave, right? And mm-hmm. you have Teletran, who's like, well, Teletran is sentient. He has conversations with people, but he talks different. And he doesn't move about. He's like a stationary computer. So why would that be? Maybe it's because Teletran has to have so many sensors monitoring so much in the world that there's no room left for conversational. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it, it means that like it's 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 diverting most of its functions to doing all these other things. It's literally watching everything in the world at once, mm-hmm. which means that you aren't going to have the bandwidth to say like, "Hey, how was your weekend?" Right. <laughs> or, be, or be able to go for a walk. You know, it's like I got to sit here. I can't move. I got to watch everything. Mm. So, I like that. That's my theory. Oh, good. So we're shown a map of the Earth with lights representing the moving oil tankers, which are all converging in the map's middle, which is basically somewhere near the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And Prime notes that this is near the Decepticon Undersea Headquarters, which is the first real indication we've gotten of its location, I believe. So it really hurts to think about if you think of the times (laughs) that the Autobots, or Carly even, just casually went to Decepticon Headquarters from Autobot Headquarters. (laughs) So I'm going to stop thinking about that right this second. Literally every time that happens, it's Skyfire taking them all the way except for the last hundred yards. (laughs) That's the Transformers version of a wizard did it. (laughs) Next question. Yes, over here. Right. In episode BF12, you were battling barbarians while riding a winged Appaloosa. Yet in the very next scene, my dear, you're clearly atop a winged Arabian. Please to explain it. Ah, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. I see. All right, yes. But in episode AG4... Wizard. Ah, for glaving out. Even when Carly snuck off on her own? Yep. Yep, she Uh bribed Skyfire. She's like, look, I'll get you a subscription to Runner's World. (laughs) Just take me out there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Prime naturally thinks that Megatron is responsible for this, and he says... My olfactory sensors detect a rat named Megatron. Another example of a line where I went like, what's an olfactory sensor? And mm-hmm. run to the dictionary. Olfactory, oh, it refers to smell. Oh, you know, like I look at doing that at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Just then, Teletran gets an incoming message calling for Prime. It's the scientist from earlier, Dr. Gates, warning Prime that their supercomputer at Torque 3 has taken control of all of the machines in the compound. And Prime, clearly on a first-name basis with the guy, (laughs) tells Paul that he won't let him down. Yeah, that affected me too as a child. Because it was one of those situations where it's like, whoa, is there a relationship here I don't know about? You know, is there like another episode where we meet this guy and like he and Optimus go, like, go fishing or something and become <laughs> friends? You know, and not, and not that specifically, but you get what I mean. Like, like it implies backstory there that like, mm-hmm. and this is where like I was so accustomed to the suggestion of backstory without ever getting it that it's just I assume that this is how you do this kind of storytelling. Mm. <laughs> so, but then like Paul like almost summons his Autobot doppelganger into the room, right? <laughs> So then, in wanders Hound, who asks if they shouldn't stop the Decepticons amassing of all that oil first. And so Prime decides to put Hound and Skyfire on the Decepticon trail. And Spike then enters and volunteers, so he makes it a trio, while the remaining Autobots, including Wheeljack, Prowl, Sideswipe, and Ironhide, head to Quantum Labs to help out Prime's good buddy Paul. (laughs) So, the exchange between Hound and Optimus is interesting here, because Optimus is like, all right, Paul, we're on our way. Don't worry, Paul. We got you. And then Hound's like, but but what about all those oil tankers? And Optimus is like, yeah, well, our friends are in danger. And it's not a, a huge moment of tension in the story, but it's like clearly we have to split up. We have to mm-hmm. like divide our resources because Megatron is creating danger on multiple fronts. And I just like this is something we talk about a lot is like it's it's always or it seems like it's always more fun when the Autobots are at a disadvantage. And that disadvantage doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of power. Right. It could just be in terms of Megatron's just crafty and he just like lights six fires. So you got to divide your resources accordingly. You know, like in in Transformers animated, it's like, okay, well, let's just make the Autobots physically weaker. So Megatron is physically more scary when when Mm -hmm. that fight actually happens. But in this, it's like, here's an example how you do the same thing where it's like maybe Optimus and Megatron are pretty evenly matched. But Megatron is always going to make it harder for you to win because he's got six little things happening at the same time versus one threat like the solar needle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we get a transition as Prime's team pulls up at Quantum. 
we see Tork react to their arrival by unleashing army tanks against them, and a battle <laughs> immediately erupts. Wheeljack rips the turret of a tank off, only to find no human at the controls. So Prowl tells Wheeljack to stand clear as he blows up the tank. The other Autobots join in, now assuming that no humans are endangered, and make short work of all the tanks until a second wave arrives. I thought it was kind of interesting how they tore open one tank, nope, no human, and then they just blow <laughs> yeah. away all the other tanks. From, from, a, from a visual storyteller standpoint, there was a much more elegant way to do this. Just show one of the Autobots, like, their eyes change color, and then we see, like, schematics of the tank, like, like, wireframes of the tanks, and they're like, wait a minute, there's nobody on board of any of yep. those tanks. But instead, it's like, they do, like, the, the most 80s macho thing in the world where he rips the top of the tank off, and it's like, nobody's in there. Well, they must all be empty. Blow them up. <laughs> <laughs> this episode does feel in a lot of ways, like a Schwarzenegger movie. There's like a lot of like one-liners and carnage coming up. Well, the Autobots are surrounded by some reinforcement tanks, causing Prime to exclaim, Good grief. More bad news. This isn't one of our shining days. And yes, I would very much agree. So the Autobots are under attack from various army vehicles, even some that don't appear to have offensive weaponry. <laughs> Prime orders to shoot out their tires, and the tanks and other vehicles just keep coming, not giving Prime a second to rest. And knowing that they need backup, we hear Prime say to Prowl, There's only one way to deal with this, and that's to stomp it flat. Dinobots! I only hope they can get here before we've had it. And now we head into commercial break one. Whew! Yeah, pretty intense way to close out this first act where the Autobots are completely overwhelmed. There's only three people on a crack mission to stop Megatron from stealing all the oil in the world. So, I don't know. Pretty intense, and I'm still amped up, and I'm, I'm excited about this future where computers will talk to us. Wait, the future is now as I play with my speak and spell. He's learning spelling with Texas Instruments Speak and Spell. L-R-A-I-N. That is correct. She's teaching her brother with speak and spell. H-E-R. That is right. <laughs> okay, I'm learning too. <laughs> now spell crap for brains. <laughs> that is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a few things as like crushing as the speak and spell voice telling you that you're incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as far as computers that we could uh, play with during this commercial break, I know it doesn't talk to us, but it can teach you about the solar system, and Mom can even balance her checkbook with it, too. So why don't we play with a Commodore 64? The Commodore 64. Once you get it, you'll wonder how you got along without it. Well, you know, those weird vehicles that Torque was controlling kind of look too futuristic for the Autobots to beat. So I'm breaking up my Battle Force 2000 vehicles to lend them moral support because nobody but nobody beats G.I. Joe. Battle Force 2000 figures and vehicles sold separately. Collect all six vehicles to form the future fortress. Joe, Joe! Battle Force 2000. <laughs> and they were very prescient when they created those. Remember when we were all driving around 20 years ago and then... Like six of us decided to make a base out of all of our vehicles and just yeah, hang out there cars, for a while. <laughs> all of our cars could turn into a fort. Yep. And then like one of them is, is actually a sphere that just like flies around. This this giant flying eyeball with a gun on it. Yep. You nailed it, Hasbro. <laughs> they were the Nostradamus of toy designers. <laughs> all right. Do you want to get back to it? Wow. Well. I guess we should return to the show, even though Battle Force 2000 is so fun. <laughs> well, as we return, you didn't sense any sarcasm there, did you? Anyway, as we return, <laughs> Prow is surprised to find more and more tanks coming their way, causing the Autobots to keep defending themselves against this unending onslaught. Yeah, it just starts like Optimus is kind of like lurched over and probably like, oh, we can't stop. And Optimus is like, I wish the Dinobots would get here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's like the first instance of like super tired prime, which we'll get to like when we get to like season four. But like that delivery, that line always cracked me up ever since I was a kid. 
Oh, I sure <laughs> wish they'd get here. Because like he's been like kind of John Wayne earlier on in this episode, but like they're really driving home the fact that these guys are feeling beaten down. So mm-hmm. asking you shall receive, right, Prime? Yep. Then who should rush in but the Dinobots? And Prime has never been more relieved to unleash these guys, so he gives the order to attack the vehicles. And Grimlock is happy to help, but he comments, Always get Autobots out of messes they get into. Dinobots, smash them! So now we sort of definitely start hitting home with that idea that the Dinobots are who you call when you're in a super jam. It's Mm -hmm. like the same as in every episode of the original Voltron when they couldn't (laughs) defeat the Robeast with using the lions. What did they do? Well, we we form Voltron with the lions, and then they defeat the Robeast in like three seconds. We gave it a five-minute effort. We can't seem to do anything. (laughs) Call the Dinobots. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking as I was watching this one, like it's like kind of like playing Golden Axe, and like you save up your magic, you save yeah. up your magic, you save up your magic. Now there's a thousand skeletons in the room. All right, time to unleash the magic, you know. Yeah. And that's 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 the Dinobots' function. They're the Golden Axe power up. This is a great scene to watch too if you want to pay attention to that staging, blocking, and composition we've talked about a lot in the show. Is this episode features a lot of shots like using diagonal compositions, like a lot. Uh, I, I did a bunch of screen grabs for us to like look at together. Like when Grimlock and the Dinobots walk into the screen to like when he says Dinobots smash him, it's got this cool like you know the the top left of the screen is all sky and the bottom right is the the, the big hulking forms of the Dinobots. It's shot from three quarters up shot, so they look really big and impressive. Also. If you want to pay very close attention, this is a rare scene where like they actually use black shadows on the characters. Doesn't happen mm-hmm. a lot in this series. I want to say in humanoids and visionaries to some extent did this a lot. I can't remember if Jem or GI Joe did it very much, but it just it felt more intense because they put black shadows and everything, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it and they all transform in the in the sort of the bottom right of the screen and then proceed across the screen. It's a really cool looking shot. So even if like the story isn't really selling you, I feel like visually this is a, a really lovely episode to watch it in terms of like delivering the excitement of giant robots smashing things. <laughs> and smash things they do. They transform to dino mode and commence the smashing. And we get yeah. no less than 50 seconds of just <laughs> Dinobots versus army vehicles. And it's a very one-sided fight. As always, the Dinobots are completely OP and practically unstoppable. Yeah. And then they, they walk up to Optimus, and there's another great diagonal shot, like where everything is like all the Dinobots in their upper left, and Optimus is in the lower right. And there's a really cute moment after they get together where like they, they we see them the feet the Autobots' feet running diagonally across the screen, immediately followed by the Dinobots' feet running across the screen. So just it's a good one to pay attention to composition. That's all I'm saying. It's like really keep your eye on the screen and watch like or you could even like hold a ruler up uh, across the the bottom left and the upper right part of the screen and watch how they staged all these shots. It's really well done. And I've definitely gone on record before saying that I'm not a huge fan of the Dinobots, but To me, this is peak Dinobot. This is how they're (laughs) used best. This is how they come across as characters best. Yeah. Uh, This is before they get a little sort of dumbed down and farcical and sort of season three sort of status quo Mm -hmm. where Grimlock's suddenly like so dumb that uh, he misunderstands just about everything. And and yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. It's 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 it has its pros and cons, but yeah, like right now they're like the scene like in you know like an Avengers movie when Thor comes into the room with yeah. know, like hits the lightning on the ground and everybody falls down. Like that's the Dinobots fight. And as a kid, that's how they felt to me. Like it's like like when when Grimlock walks in, it's like oh you're in trouble now. And then they they yeah. don't disappoint because we get fifty full seconds of them just wrecking up the place. Yep. it's pretty great. This is the same. Grimlock that just last episode took like three shots from Megatron's fusion cannon. So, I mean, these are definitely overpowered characters. Yeah. Well, then Prime then leads the others to the building that his buddy Paul is in, which they find by Paul and his friend waving from the open window. (laughs) There are a handful of floors up, so Prime asks Sludge for a boost as the Dinobot lifts Prime up to the window. And he says, going down... Oh, come on, that's super cute. That's super cute. And it's also very, like, again, very Schwarzenegger-y, like, where it's like, he's got lots of one-liners 
am- mm-hmm. amidst all of this carnage. He had to split. <laughs> it's very much, yes, it's the kid's version of that. So after the rescue, Prime and Paul are trying to get to the bottom of what's behind the takeover of Torque 3. But Prime is absolutely certain it's Megatron. Mm. Paul claims that Torque can't just take over any machine. But then we suddenly see Sparkplug is here, showing the circuit board thingy that was attached to a tank. So the gang deduces that Torque can control any device with one of those doodads on it. And Mm. Prime holds onto the one Sparkplug hands him, slipping it into a little opening in his wrist. Which really seems like a bad idea. What if Torque can control Prime now? I guess, like... The thing in his wrist blocks Bluetooth. <laughs> it's something like that, right? It's yeah. just like something like, okay, well, no signals can come in or out of this special compartment on my wrist, but yeah. <laughs> well, we cut to Torque itself, saying that it will take more than those Autobots to shut him down. As the Autobots approach Torque's building and get past the locked doors, thanks to a well-placed shot from Prime's rifle. And here we get another like Schwarzenegger esque like sort of like lighthearted quip amongst all this danger is that like oh it's a, uh, what is it that Paul says like a safe bet those doors are locked, and then Optimus says like fortunately I've got a delicate lock picking technique and then just blows the door up right yeah. <laughs> so like this this stuff I feel like mm, maybe it doesn't travel very well to twenty twenty, but it gives me a blast of nostalgia of like really loving like those kinds of movies when I was a kid, which mm. again, when I say it doesn't travel well, it's because like when I watch commando now and I'm like, yikes, it's just like, it's just nothing. He murders so many people in that movie, <laughs> you know, and like, and it's all cheerfully done. I'm like, yeah, I don't know how Yay, I feel about that. Murder. <laughs> he put a circular saw on the guy's head. Hooray. You know, it's like, gosh, it, it, it just, it feels very, very post-apocalyptic when I watch it today. <laughs> So, so like it, this feels like it's skirting in that direction, but and so it's feel like it's a little bit of the time. But yes, so Optimus shoots the wall open with his delicate lock picking technique, and what happens? <laughs> and immediately, those goofy wheeled warrior looking robo tanks from the beginning emerge and give the Autobots a whole other level of threat. But then we cut away from this and catch up with Skyfire, Spike, and Hound, who are converging on the meeting of the oil tankers in the middle of the Atlantic. The trio are sure that the Decepticons will pump all the oil down to their HQ via an oil platform below that they've built and protected via a force field. So the guys aren't sure how to proceed, but Hound gets an idea and has Skyfire land on one of the tankers below. This is a pretty interesting landing sequence too, right? Like I don't I don't want to get, you know, Bandai all mad at me. But <laughs> how Skyfire lands on the tank, he sort of transforms his feet out you know he does in what in macross or robotech would be considered a jerwalk or a guardian mode which you know being that he was originally that same toy you know yep. could do but then they had to sort of you know modify jet fire and make him not look like anything from macross to use him in this cartoon so this is one of those sort of unusual times where he sort of does something that mm, probably he shouldn't legally but (laughs) i don't know but it's cool looking his legs like flip out and then like like jets blast out of his feet and then he's like half in jet mode and like hound and spike jump out of him and then he finishes transforming yeah And so a captain of the oil tanker emerges as Hound and Spike exit, and the captain asks for some help, saying that the ship won't respond to his commands, and Hound gets an idea. He asks the captain to hide them so he can unleash a surprise on the Decepticons. So then we see the force field lower as the tanker pulls into the oil platform next to several other oil tankers. We cut to Megatron, and... Well, we hear Constructicon Hook over a radio say that the ship is ready for cargo removal now next to megatron there's this crane that looks a lot like hook here but not exactly and it's yellow instead of green so we have to guess that this was supposed to just be hook there but something got lost in the translation and to compensate they sort of made hook sound like he was radioing in from somewhere. Oh, that's know. how you read that? Okay, yeah. that that actually makes a lot of sense. That that Because, yeah, you're right. It, it threw me off, too. And I'm like, why was his voice over the radio? So, yeah, I guess Hook was just, like, someplace else. He, he was delegating to, like, one of the human machines that happened to look a lot like him. Yeah, there we go. We guess. So the point <laughs> is, they're getting the oil off the oil tankers. 
but Hound has used this opportunity to surprise Megatron as he and Skyfire emerge guns blazing. And Megatron responds, yelling Decepticons attack, and out comes Soundwave, Laserbeak, and Rumble. But then Hound tells Hook, No more oil, Hook! You're greasy enough already! And then Hound shoots the tube that is draining off the oil. Throughout all this, Hook remains yellow and unmoving, so it's just weird. So maybe it wasn't Hook there? Uh, uh-huh. uh, but also, this was Hound's plan. Did he consult with Broad? It's like, I got a plan. We're going to hide. We're going to be over here. Yeah, and then what do we do? And then when they open the force, we jump out, we shoot him. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Hound, I thought you were a little bit more clever than that. But yeah, I guess that was their plan. Okay. So then the typical Autobot Decepticon square-offs happen, but Laserbeak spots Spike, and then he picks him up, carting him off. Now, I was all ready to tick the tally of Spike yelling for help here. We've been stuck at eight since before season one ended, but Spike doesn't actually yell for help. Instead, he just yells at Laserbeak to let him go and calls him a beaky bird brain. And it makes me wonder, is the ubiquitous and often made fun of by me Spike yelling for help (laughs) just a season one thing? So we'll have to see. Yeah, you know, I have to wonder if this is something where we made a lot of hay out of this just because we watched a lot of season one episodes when we were right. younger. Yeah. You know, the, the, the majority of FHE tapes that I had were all season one episodes. Actually, I don't think I had any season two episodes in FHE tapes. And then I lost all of my season two VHS recordings, I want to say, when I was in high school. And so I didn't get to revisit the entire season again until I was in my early 20s when i think we got a collection of vhs tapes off of ebay is that right does that does that that sound like the timeline is correct i think maybe you picked up the set of taped off tv tapes at a convention i want to say that happened fairly soon after we started talking yeah i think that's right so there's this gap of I want to say well between the, when I was in between 14 and about like 22 where I just didn't have access to those episodes anymore. So I went a long time without watching these. And I have to wonder if this is a perfect example of pay close attention to the material you're you're bashing or riffing on, right? Because maybe the assumptions you're coming to are not entirely accurate assumptions, right? Like, so like, this is like something I, I have a personal chip on my shoulder with people who like just raz on say Thundercats because of Snarf. Oh, Snarf was so dumb. Oh, Snarf was so awful. Watch the show carefully, watch it closely and look at what function the character performs and watch what they do with that character over the entire season. He isn't just one thing or another thing. He's a lot of things. And I wonder if it's the same with Spike and the, the, the story that we've been compiling over watching these episodes one at a time well, let me say I've been compiling is, is my, my hypothesis about how the, the Autobots always make better choices as a result of Spike or another human being there. And then also this idea that we've watched Spike sort of earn Optimus's trust. So it's not that he's pushing himself into these missions. He deserves to be there. He has every right to be there because he's proven that he's every bit as brave, courageous and clever and inventive as any Autobot is. And he contributes to every mission. And here's Lazerby picking him up. And yeah, he's not doing the whole like what he did in Fire in the Sky. <laughs> <laughs> Please help! <laughs> no, he's he's cussing him out. That's amazing. Spike is continuing to be like he's he just keeps on winning my support. Where I'm going to vote for him for president. <laughs> also, there's a really nice like more diagonal compositions to be found in this scene where like Hound rushes into the shot from the bottom right. We're looking up at him. It's just it's just continuing to have like a lot of lovely compositions. As you know, as Hound is considering, like, oh no, laser beaks at Spike. Just still, still store right there and look at what they did with the composition. Is great. So, what happens to Spike? Well, laser beak takes him back to Megatron, and then Megatron says, "I'll throw him onto the rocks if the Autobots don't surrender." So then, Hound and Skyfire drop their guns, and then we mm. cut back to our other team of Autobots who are still trying to battle past the Wheeled Warriors. Torque is unleashed on them. <laughs> and I literally sighed when I saw this. I'm like, how much of this do I have to watch? Yeah. We get it. We get it. There's tons of tanks. So far, the Autobots and Dinobots have smashed everything unleashed against them. It just took time. No Autobots have died or conked out or anything. They're just simply delayed by these numerous tanks and weird wheeled warrior things. So now we're expected to watch more and more of the Autobots overcoming the odds. Enough. We get it. 
We get it. It reminds me of like, you know, those like brawler video games, kind of yeah, like the, yeah. the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game and that Bad sort of dudes. thing. Not not the NES version, but like the arcade version. Yes. Where it's yeah. like, they're fun games, but after a while, it's like after you beat up 200 foot soldiers, it's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> it's not fun anymore. So I, I recently went to an arcade in Columbus where they had free play Mutant Ninja Turtles, the, the first one, the four player simultaneous. And we got all the way to the end. And then you have to fight all the bosses again before you get to the final boss. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I could see how you could like that would be reminiscent of this. It just it just keeps coming. And there's no there's no skill acquisition. Right. right. There's just button mashing till you get yeah. to the end. And yeah. So. This feels kind of like that. There's there's some cute moments coming up with some more one-liners, but I I get what you're saying. Yeah, in a lot of ways, as I was watching this one again, I was like, you know, there's and I think about like how this episode frightened me in so many ways because Torque was so creepy and the robots were so weird look, looking. I was like, but it's also just about like just like mowing down. I was like, this is like Saw meets Chopping Mall. Like mm-hmm. like the, the the I don't know if you ever saw Chopping Mall. <laughs> but it's just teenagers making the ball. But being chased by by homicidal police robots. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it, it goes on and on for how long? Well, I'm not exaggerating here. I timed it for a solid two minutes, 120 <laughs> seconds. We see the Autobots battle these wheeled warriors and almost get defeated until they finally get the upper hand. And for some reason, the Dinobots aren't even around anymore. Which doesn't help mm. anything. So it's like they called the Dinobots to help them out of the jam. So then they just sent them home. It's like, okay, we're out of the jam. <laughs> By the way, we're not done here at the laboratory, but you guys go ahead and go home. I'm sure we won't need you anymore. <laughs> so that's just that just doubles my head scratching at this episode. Because, I mean, you have to look at it from this standpoint. Basically, the story writer took the Decepticons, who I love, and swapped them out as adversaries with mm-hmm. tanks that have no personality. Yeah. So that is not an upgrade to me. That's not an exciting story. What I come to for these stories is the characterization first and foremost. I I don't go, wow, that was a great battle that Prime and Megatron just had. I really liked how they were swinging at each other. No, mm-hmm. I the things I like are the quips the characterization, the times where Prime gets under Megatron's skin, all that sort of thing, that's yeah. what I come here for. I don't come here for two solid minutes of Autobots smashing tanks with no personality. That the, you, is boring you, to me. You, you're raising, I think, a very fair criticism of this episode, and I have a couple of observations. One is, I think, again, it, it feels very of its time, because it, as I rewatched it again, I just remember thinking, like, this feels like every over-the-top 80s action-adventure movie of that period. Like, like again, like Commando, The Running Man, you know, First Blood Part Two, that kind of thing. And the, the, the thing that I find... And, and, and I think the comparison is very almost one-to-one in that if you think about the end of commando which i used to joke about ages ago with you remember like schwarzenegger kills something like 80 or 90 people (laughs) in the the Mm. final act of that movie like one-on-one he's just murdering them one after another and it's like wow it just keeps going and i remember as a a young person it was like just adrenaline like oh kill bad guys right but then you think about it a little bit more concretely, and it's like, wait a minute, those are all people. Those are people who have families. <laughs> and maybe they're making bad choices, and they are endangering Arnold Schwarzenegger's daughter, but you know, surely there's got to be a better way to do this. But you can't do that kind of action sequence with characters who have personalities. You have to other them. You have to turn them into monsters. Otherwise, we're going to feel that cognitive dissonance of, yeah, that's a guy with a family that just got a saw blade you know, buried in his head. So you can't do this story with the Decepticons as the bad guys, right? Because there's a lot of, like, there's, like, alligator robots that, like, they rip the jaw off of. <laughs> They're ripping arms and legs off of these things. And if they did that with Starscream, we would be horrified. <laughs> <laughs> because Starscream is a person. You know, so they have to make them, you know, unintelligent, like, unthinking robots that they can just do this carnage to which raises the question then what's the value of the carnage what purpose does it serve except to just sort of celebrate mayhem and violence because what is like you're pointing out like what are they really overcoming here except a bunch of physical uh, obstacles 
Hey, there's no winning over the bad guy, outfoxing the bad guy, you know, mm-hmm. stopping the bad. You know, there's there isn't that contest between the personalities, and it points to the fact that I think I, my hypothesis is, is that neither of us are really here for the violence. This this episode, the fact that it falls flat, shows us that the carnage is incidental to what brings us to the actual story. Right. right. We're here right. we're here about the conflict between these two parties and their worldviews and the clash of different personalities both within each faction and between each faction. And how much how much actual carnage we get really is kind of beside the point. And I think I think I think I framed up what our taste is in these kids' cartoons. Yeah, I mean we've sort of come to the conclusion before that I'm sort of a refined twelve year old when it comes to these things. <laughs> And this just strikes me as... He wears an ascot as he jigs his his Mm ecto-cooler. I'm like that Winnie the Pooh meme where uh, on the top level he's just regular Winnie the Pooh, but at the bottom picture he's he's got like a suit on and he's refined all of a sudden. (laughs) But like this strikes me as this, maybe this is one of those episodes that's just good for eight-year-olds because it seems like it's sort of staged that way it's like and then the autobots have to fight all these tough tanks and and then they they win and then they have to fight even tougher tanks and then they win and then they get (laughs) even tougher tanks so it's like it seems like it was sort of written from an eight-year-old perspective maybe and if so Mm -hmm. that's fine you know, I'm not I'm not here complaining like, oh, this doesn't hold up to my 43-year-old sensibilities. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that. But mm-hmm. I'm saying that this probably just is not ever going to be an episode that I really have a lot of good things to talk about just because no, the... it just seems more 8-year-old focused rather than my distinguished 12-year-old self. If I were to, to, to yes and that, I would say that I think the episodes that we've wound up celebrating are the ones where there seems to be some kind of aboutness to the characters. We explore something about the characters in the context of a battle. Like there's, mm-hmm. yes, we're looking for a battle. We're looking for some physical conflict between these characters. And like I've talked about like imaginative fight scenes, you know, like that's fun to do, but that's not the main thing. That's something that is a framework and sort of a scaffolding to hang on this idea of let's look at what makes these characters interesting. Whether mm-hmm. it's Fire in the Sky, where we're watching a character sort of navigating, like, I have a function, but these other characters are telling me that that's not the right function. What's what's the real answer here? Do I find the answer within me or do I listen to them, right? Mm-hmm. Or is it like Traitor, where we found out that, like, hey, we like this episode quite a bit, you know? Why? Well, because there was lots and lots of little character moments where we got to, like, explore, like, the the landscape of different personalities that make up this world called the Transformers, right? Mm-hmm. Plot-wise, very simple, right? But, like, interesting because there's these memorable moments where we learn a little bit about somebody. We're not really learning anything about anybody in this one, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we got Paul, right. <laughs> who's very concerned about robots. But like, really, if you if you were to write out a list of what do we learn about anybody in this episode, it's it's a pretty thin list. So mm-hmm. it becomes more about yeah you know, the gratuitous action, which again I think it just feels so '80s, not in the good way, right? Yeah. It feels it feels very much like a caricature of what entertainment was back then might makes right knock down the bad guys do it in a way where you got a couple cool quips maybe make it just like a little bit more painful than it needs to be you know just to have like that extra like rubbing it in kind of thing so i get you and and actually i i don't i don't know if i would necessarily call it bad writing but it's it's something to point to to say that like if you think that making it more intense always makes it better here's an example where we could say does it does it really Mm. look hard yeah. And I would also say like it's worth watching for just how well it's told. I would say it's a beautifully told story that has very thin on material. It's 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 a bit mm. it's a bit weak as far as like interesting intellectual or emotional nourishment, but it's gosh darn is it pretty looking cuz like there's a shot where Optimus like rips apart <laughs> one of those wheeled warriors and then again you got this cool diagonal shot where like Optimus walks across the upper left of the screen and the wreckage falls to the bottom right of the screen everything just keeps moving in that direction and there's like a neat shot where sideswipe does like a little bit 
of like a one liner bit, like where he's being grabbed by these this this thing that's just covered in arms, and he's like, "Time for you two to get acquainted." And he grabs the two wrists thing and smashes them together, which somehow like makes the machine shut down. But <laughs> it's like th- there's this really nice shot where like the robot is covering up the whole top right of the frame, and Sideswipe is being sort of surrounded by the robot in the bottom left of the frame. So it's just like, you know, it's again not much to think about as far as story, but it's just so beautifully put together. So that it's like, mm. I think that this is why this one hung in my brain. It's like, I don't think about anything story-wise that I found very interesting, but it just, I remember it feeling very exciting because of, and I think it's because of the way it's shot. Yeah, I mean, it's not Call of the Primitives level animation by any means, but it's definitely a well done, well put together visually episode. Yeah. Yep. The storyboard artists knew what they were doing when they were doing this one. Yeah. Oh, and in case you don't know... uh Call of the Primitives is a season three episode that was done by a <laughs> animation company that I think only ever did that episode, and it looks yeah. awesome. But we'll talk about that in season three. Yeah, and that's another one where like the story's kind of weak sauce, but the animation mm-hmm. and the framing is just gorgeous. Yeah. So where are we now? The Autobots wreck up everything. Yeah, two minutes of fighting later, the Autobots have wrecked all those wheeled warriors, so they can finally enter the building now. And Ironhide says that it must be some kind of a maze because they get in there and there's suddenly all these walls around. Now, Torque then beckons the Autobots to him, and Prime says they can't risk all going in at once because Prime knows it's a trap. So Prime has the others wait outside as he alone enters, prepared to deal with Torque on his own. And the military strategist Prowl says, it's a trap, Prime, as Mm -hmm. Prime walks away. (laughs) Yeah, I really like... They almost always hit it out of the park with everything Prowl says. I mean, it's sort of a Sunbow staple... That whenever anyone talks, you know, it's going to reflect their personality. And yeah. I can't think of a single thing Prowl has ever said, except for maybe that time he goes, you think the Decepticons did this? <laughs> except for maybe that. It's yeah. it's always about, like, thinking about strategy. And Prowl's role is the military strategist. It says it right on his text back card. And mm-hmm. just like when Sunstreaker talks, it's almost always about how vain he is, about how, oh, he's going to mess up his paint job, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These are things that Sunbow gets an A++ on almost every time. You know, you you can't just change out Huffer dialogue for Sunstreaker dialogue for Prowl dialogue and just have it all be generic. It doesn't work Mm -hmm. that way. And that's a great thing. They make these characters feel real. It doesn't matter that they can turn into a car it, what matters is their personality, and you feel like you know them after yep. only experiencing them in one or two episodes. You know the difference between the characters right away. Mm-hmm. Vibrant characters, right? Mm-hmm. And you can sum them up in a sentence, and that and that sentence usually works for just about everything they say and do. And, and that's, that is definitely something that we come back to the show for again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And in a show with this amount of characters, you know, you pretty much have to do that or just risk being seen as like, okay, these are a bunch of good guys and those are a bunch of bad guys and that's all that's really clear. But instead, they go above and beyond and that's in typical Sunbow fashion. Yeah, and we've taken episodes to task when the ba- when the Decepticons just show up to be bad guys, mm-hmm. right? Like th- yeah. that 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 gets a boo from the audience because like, no, 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 you don't you don't just get to say they're bad. You know, we we showed up for more than that. Yep. So. I have to imagine that's part of what's bumming you out about this one too, is that, yeah, they're really just overcoming nothing except danger. Right. Mm -hmm. And on the Decepticon side, you've basically got Soundwave and Megatron and no one else. So Mm -hmm. missed opportunities, it seems. But anyway, speaking of the Decepticons, we cut back to them and we see Hound, Spike and Skyfire have all been imprisoned. And Hound exclaims, Caged like helio hamsters at the Cybertron Zoo. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Speaking of recurring dialogue themes and, and characterization, it's like, it just seems like initially there was going to be like some more animal stuff involved mm-hmm. in Transformers because they never don't bring it up. All the time, it's helio hamsters, zap mice, cybertronic bolt bats. Yeah, uh, uh, 
it, it's just that, so that titanium much. moose bot. <laughs> why? Why is there so much of something that we never see anything of? Right. And I feel like this is where it was something they were doing just to be like playful and fun, but it, it points to an opportunity mm-hmm. to do something very interesting in that we're already dealing with a species of creature that comes in various size and shapes. They have different organs, right? Like Gears has a part that no other Autobot has, mm-hmm. you know, like, and, and they have different kinds of cognition where you can have a Teletran one be like a friend of the organization, but he's obviously extremely different from everybody else in the way he talks and acts. And so now, if you have the species, they could do that. What would they say if they came to a planet where, oh, there's multiple species of creatures and some of them keep them to other ones in cages? What would they say, right? Uh, no, they just have zoos too. Oh, okay. <laughs> it almost seems like it started out as like a running joke and then it just like, it, it just <laughs> lost all its appeal just because it didn't make sense. Right, it's 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 the David S. Pumpkins joke, but it just goes on yeah, and on. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just like, okay, just stop, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> we see Hound, Skyfire, and Spike imprisoned in this little storage room type thing with a bunch of junk in it, and we see Rumble and Ravage guarding the outside of the door as Hound and the guys brainstorm how they're going to escape. The Decepticons took their weapons, of course, so what are they going to do? Who will save them? Don't worry. When the time comes, I've got a plan. That's right. And when Spike says that, relax. It's going to be okay. (laughs) So now we cut back to Prime, trying to navigate this labyrinth to find Torque. And Torque's just being coy with him, unleashing more wheeled warriors against Prime. So Prime <laughs> fends them off, blows a hole through the wall, and counters even more of them. Yeah, we get it. We get it. So Torque brings a door down behind Prime, trapping him in a hallway with... Hey, you ready for this? <laughs> Traps him with a bigger wheeled warrior with lots of tendrils. <laughs> <sighs> I I can't. I can't continue. Jersey, you tell us what happens. <laughs> okay, so this big wheeled warrior, which like has a bunch of tendrils and arms, it tries to slap one of those circuit breaker thingies uh, onto Optimus so that Torque can just control Prime himself, and he does. Prime instantly slowly begins walking as Torque beckons him on. Well, at least that makes sense story wise. When I was <laughs> rewatching this for the first time in ages, I was I was like, oh, well, at least that's happening. <laughs> at least there's some like rising tension besides just like knocking things down <laughs> so we see prime entering torque's command center past more wheeled warriors of course as torque celebrates victory claiming that soon he'll control all the autobots and then we head to our second commercial break yeah, so as we end, as we get into the like the moment where it fades to black before we go into commercial, Torque does this line where it says, I, Torque, will be master of everything. And they pitch his voice up really high, like a little bit there. So it gets just enough like Judge Doom when it's revealed like who he really is. And like he does that, his voice like suddenly just sp- spins up that high pitch. And I remember watching it in the theater and there's like a little kid, like three seats over, who just started crying. And the dad's like, it's okay, it's okay, it's just the movie, you know? <laughs> And it's like, this has like a little bit of that sort of like pitching up really high just to make it a little bit more disturbing. And this is one of those moments that I have a very clear memory as a kid being like, yeah, maybe I'm not fully on board with like what the tension is of this episode, but I know that's scary. I know that's disturbing. So something bad is going to happen. And I, I, uh, as you know, commercial breaks go, it's not bad. So got some drama, got evil computer have we always feared computers so i say no listen to how gently and sweetly we talked about texas instrument computers back then (laughs) for the first time in his life he's struggling having a hard time in math needs help he can get that help with the home computer from texas instruments it has more educational cartridges than any other computer i mean Seriously, like that harmonica convinces you that computers can't all be bad. (laughs) Or 
You could listen to how cheerfully we talked about making pie charts and doing word processing once along came Atari. <laughs> But okay, I guess we also understood they could be used for nefarious purposes too because there was that rodent Stevie who tricked those nice girls with big hair using his Amiga Commodore computer. <laughs> the Amiga computer. Professional video production at amateur prices. Stevie, you rodent. Amiga from Commodore. The computer for the creative mind. I don't know if you remember that one either. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I found a whole bunch of like home computer commercials. And in this one, this kid, like he like hooks up his computer to like the cable input on the neighbor's house. So it's all these like big haired girls watching like an award show. And then he suddenly walks on and accepts an award. They're like, what, Stevie? And they look out the window and like he's like, whoa, he's just, like shrugging his shoulders. I'm like you rodent. Wow. And it's all about like how Amiga Commodores are so advanced. You can like fake TV signals. <laughs> so we're back. And Optimus is now a slave, right? Well, we return to Torque telling Prime that he's now his master. But then suddenly Prime rips off the circuit board without so much of a strain or a grunt, telling Torque not to count on it. Whoa. Optimus fooled him. And he kind of fooled me, too, I have to say. Mm. So Prime explains that he slipped a dead circuit breaker card into Torque's robot's hand, presumably the one we saw Prime keep from earlier. Mm. So now that Prime's revealed that he's not under control... Torque turns the remaining wheeled warriors on him. So it seems like maybe this was a bad time for Prime to reveal that he wasn't <laughs> under control. I guess they didn't want to keep us too much on edge after that commercial break, but okay. So Prime dodges the machines and smashes Torque's keypad, which shuts Torque and his wheeled warriors down. So Prime's done it, but there's still six minutes left in this episode, so. Hmm. Well, we cut back to the Decepticon's oil derrick, where Soundwave informs Megatron that he detects that Torque has been defeated. And Megatron assumes that the Autobots are to blame, but it doesn't matter, because Megatron has a machine thing that's going to control the tankers in the same way. <laughs> he literally has a backup computer that's about the size of like what a home computer would have been to a person back then, like but scaled up to his size. Yeah. Why did we go through all that nonsense with Torque? <laughs> If Megatron could just make this thing that could do it anyway. I mean, I understand you want to have a backup plan if you're a good villain. But mm -hmm. if your backup plan negates the initial plan, mm -hmm. it, uh, I, I don't know anymore. I want this well, I guess... episode to be done. <laughs> I guess he just he wanted Torque to like buy him time. He knew the Autobots were to come. He knew that they were going to get past his force, force field somehow. So it's like, look, I just want to get 50 oil tankers. I don't need all the oil tankers, just 50. How long is that going to take? Okay, I take this many hours. Okay, how long can we distract the Autobots with Torque? Okay, about this many hours. Go. You know? Maybe it took time to build this thing, and he knew like while he was building it, you know, he could have Torque run things for a while. And, you know, knowing that Optimus would defeat Torque, you know, he was biding his time sort of thing, I guess. Or maybe, maybe we can rest in the fact that Frenzy's coming back over. Frenzy's coming back into the episode. So we don't have to think about this too hard because there's going to be more than just Soundwave and Megatron. Frenzy's coming back. Okay, I guess I'll finish it. <laughs> I was going to walk and leave the show forever. <laughs> we can only do so much rationalization before we're just like sort of like, you know, ruining the grooves on the record player. Um, but yes, at least we've got some more Decepticon tapes to look forward to. So, well, now we cut to Prime's good buddy, Paul, giving the Autobots a fast speedboat thing in order to get the Autobots to Megatron's oil, Derek, which Sparkplug drives out into certain story resolution. <laughs> This boat is so amazing. It's just a hydrofoil, right? He's like, that hydrofoil is the fastest thing we've got in the water. Good hunting. But like, what it does at a moment is incredible. <laughs> but first, we cut back to the West Autobot 3 in jail, and Spike has indeed come up with an idea. He finds a big electromagnet amongst all the junk in their impromptu cell, and he turns it on, holding it up to the wall where Rumble and Ravage are guarding outside. And instantly, they're stuck to the wall, unable to free themselves. 
And now they're able to break out, and Skyfire and Hound break through the door and they escape. So Spike knows the electromagnet won't last long, so Hound suggests that they disable the force field pronto. This is at least pretty good, right? Because this shows that like what, what Spike contributes to the team, not just emotionally, not just like in terms of ethics and morally, right? But when he picks up the electromagnet, like he doesn't say what it is. He's like, all right, this is what we're going to use. And Hound and Skyfire are like, electromagnet, ah, be careful with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's like, well, I don't have a metal body, so it can't hurt me. You know, so like he makes it, they make it very clear that like this was a plan that Hound and Skyfire could not do on their own. Mm-hmm. They needed Spike there to, to disable the... Why Skyfire couldn't take out Ravage and Rumble, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that aside, you know, it's like, it's cool that they're building in ways for Spike to help in a meaningful, physical way, right? And so, yeah, like, like we see Rumble and Ravage just go like, whoop, and they get stuck to the wall, and then, then yep. the Autobots bust out. That's great. So now we cut back to the Autobots' fancy new speedboat approaching Megatron's oil base. Soundwave detects that the Autobots are coming, and Megatron has complete confidence in the force field keeping them out. Speaking of the force field, Skyfire, Hound, and Spike have located the force field generator, and it's being guarded by Frenzy Hoover. Are you happy now? Okay. We're getting back on task here. now. And look how good, look at how good that shot is when you see Frenzy turn on them. So Spike gets Frenzy's attention by calling his name, which causes Frenzy to shoot at him. And as Spike ducks and runs away, Frenzy chases after him, only to be shot at from behind by Skyfire now, who exclaims, Come and get me, you metal-headed dum-dum! Boy, those are some real harsh words from Skyfire. Oh, I love how square Skyfire is! (laughs) (laughs) He doesn't have to be cool, because he's just cool because of who he is. He doesn't have to try harder than the other guys. He doesn't have to have have a cool one-liner. I love that Skyfire has the worst one-liner in the episode, and it's just making me love him even more as each episode goes on. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, so, like, (laughs) Frenzy's like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Well, I guess I'll go after the other way. Yeah, Frenzy runs back the other way after Skyfire, abandoning the force field generator, allowing Hound to blow it up in a rare moment of using his missile like an actual missile. Mm. Now, it's kind of a weird plan because... I mean, Spike didn't need to talk at all. If they just sent Skyfire around to where Skyfire was, you know, Skyfire still could have had Frenzy chase him and not have to have Frenzy make the decision of which one to chase. Right. If Skyfire was the only one he saw, he naturally would have chased Skyfire. So I'm not sure this was a fantastic plan, but it ended up working okay. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. They they got to say his name, you know? How many times do you get to hear Frenzy's name in the episode? (laughs) That's true. So the force field drops completely as this crazy fast boat actually miraculously (laughs) duke boys up onto the top of Megatron's oil platform. As if a kid picked it up and put it there. I mean, it moves just like that. (laughs) It's almost like once the duke boysing started happening in this show, it's almost like it's a check mark that they have to check off for every episode. (laughs) And it's it's like for all the compliments I've given this episode in terms of like shots and composition and everything, this scene looks so cartoony. It looks so silly because it's like a horizontal shot. Boats coming in from the right to the left, and it just goes whoop up on top yeah. of the deck of the of the platform. It doesn't like go up a ramp. It doesn't look up, like it doesn't skid into the camera in this amazing you know energetic shot. Just like it literally looks like a child picked it up and set it down. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> The Autobots disembark, and Prime and Megatron exchange the usual taunts as everyone begins pairing off, and it's only now that we get our first shot of Starscream, 18 minutes and 47 seconds into this episode. He spontaneously appears out of nowhere and wordlessly fires on the Autobots as Megatron runs away with his mysterious oil tanker's controlling device. What, that shot of Starscream is pretty great, though. It's another one that's like, look at how it diagonally, you know, bisects the frame. Like, there's so many shots like this in this one. I'm going to be more attentive to that going forward. And Prowl wisely deduces that Megatron can still control the tankers, even with Torque defeated. Again, you know, using the military strategist to say that line. Good job, <laughs> Sunbow. So he and Prime deduce that there's a remote control here somewhere. And Prime will no doubt find it if he chases after Megatron. So he does. 
and they wrestle over it until Prime essentially forces Megatron to fall on it and crush it himself, causing <laughs> Megatron to run off and flee. Prime calls out to the oil tankers and lets them know that they can now pull out and escape, so they all do. Megatron runs to the inside of his oil platform, remarking how he planned to destroy it once it served its purpose, but the Autobots have forced him to move up the timetable. He tells the Decepticons to retreat back to base as he prepares to blow the place up. We see Starscream and Thundercracker here fighting the Autobots, and boy have we missed hearing from these guys. But we're still not going to, as we simply see them all retreat. And Megatron's like, oh, remember that King Nurgle guy? He had a really great idea that when things don't go your way, just blow everything up. Because <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time. Well, Megatron has like blown up the place as he's leaving in the past to, to distract the Autobots. Right, right. Something to keep them busy as they, he escapes, usually, is his MO. But yeah, but like this feels like more like if I can't have it, nobody can kind of moment. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's really weird. But... But yeah, it's 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 creating some exciting tension in a second here. Well, Sparkplug deduces that the Decepticons' departure is bad news for them, and he's proved right by an explosion. So Megatron set off explosions on the oil platform, and now the Autobots have a big explosion that they have to flee. Everyone's rushing to their new super speedboat, but Prime can't leave until he finds Spike, Skyfire, and Hound. Funnily enough... Sparkplug doesn't seem to have any issue fleeing when they haven't found Spike yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is that that feels a little sloppy, but it also feels like oh, we don't, only got like three minutes left in the episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Prime stays behind to look for his missing friends. And the whole platform is rocked by explosions, but soon after he rips up a floor, Prime discovers the trio. We are in deep transistor parts. Hello, Skyfire. How about a lift out of here? So then Skyfire transforms and loads everybody in, and they take off before the last explosions destroy the platform. We cut to a safe, serene place and happy music as Prime has returned the boat to his good buddy Paul and is saying his goodbyes. And the Doctor lets Prime know that Torque won't ever be brought back online until he knows he can remain controlled. You see, like all machines, Torque is basically unreliable unless properly monitored. <clears throat> machine unreliable. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, but of course, there are some machine types one can always count on. I'm speaking naturally of the uh, Autobots. You took the word right out of my mouth. It was in there with my foot. Ah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> So here's another example of an idiomatic expression that I'd never heard before I watched the show. And then I had to find out, like, what does it mean wow. when your foot's in your mouth? Yeah. I remember, I grew up in a very rural area where I didn't get exposed to a whole lot. So, like, these, <laughs> when these things came up... They were just I, talking I was, about farming and sports, and that's it. Basically, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, like, when these kinds of things happened, I got very excited. And I was like, oh, well, I, I have to learn what that means. And so, yeah, like... Having your foot in your mouth. What, is that, what in the world does that mean? And then oh. I found out. I asked a grown up, asked a librarian. So, you know, it's like, uh, I'm not going to say that that's a line where they're shooting over our head, but it, it was it was cute. It's a cute moment where somebody realizes that, hey, maybe I should think more carefully before I speak because I'm, in, I'm insulting an entire race of creatures, <laughs> a species of creatures from outer space. But anyway, so yeah, there we are. They finally machines. arrive at the end. I can't say I'm a fan of this episode. In fact, I don't know if it'd be my least favorite so far, but it's 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 way down there. It's almost least favorite, if not least favorite. Wow. It's just, yeah. you have great Decepticon characters, and then you intentionally don't use them. Yeah. That's That's my major beef with this, and there's nothing you could point out about it that refutes that, so... <laughs> You know, it's reminded me of in this. I, this isn't hopefully it doesn't spoil too much, but the, again, again talking about the two thousand eight Transformers animated series, it starts out being very light on Decepticons, right? And it, it and mm. it, but it does this slow build where yeah. by the time you get to the end of season one, it's like, oh, there's Decepticons everywhere, and it's pretty awesome, and like it gives yeah. it time for you to fall in love with each individual Decepticon as you get introduced to them. And this feels like it's going in the opposite direction where it's like, here's all the Decepticons. Aren't they great? Yeah, they're really awesome. Yeah, well, they're not going to be like hardly at all in a handful of episodes next season. What? 
Well, why? Why? Why would you do that? Well, we got some other exciting villains that you might want. Hey, look at here's the here's the archer. Here's you know uh, the princess and, and her pony character. Yeah, well, but what about the Decepticons? Ah, they'll be back sometime. Yeah, I mean, and that's fine if you want to create other villains to throw in. But these these villains were just tanks. You know, there was no new <laughs> right. personalities to glom. You're right. To glom onto. At least we had the headmaster in TFA, right? Whereas this mm-hmm. is like Torque never becomes a thing again. Right. Torque just vanishes, and Torque's army is really just a bunch of interestingly designed zombies. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, I, I like I said, I have a lot of fondness for this episode from a nostalgic standpoint, and then also from like examining like the blocking stage and compositions, and you know, Spike did some awesome stuff, but I agree that from a 21st century perspective, I find it deeply problematic that it, it seems to be centered around joyous carnage. And and when I say centered, I mean like the bulk of the episode is that, and that feels incongruous with transformers, which sounds funny because it's a, it's a war cartoon. It's a cartoon about a war between two factions, but it's not really about that war. As if you really look at like what makes the show tick to me, Mm -hmm. right? So I, and I feel like the comparison of the Dinobots as the power up you get to use once feels like the reason that works is because it's contained. It's a thing that just happens for a little while and then you can get back to all the other stuff you love about this show. And when we talk about like Boothian episodes, like how like I celebrate like, oh, I'm putting everybody into little teams so you can learn about everybody else. Doesn't really happen a whole lot in this one. We don't learn anything really interesting about Skyfer or Hound in mm-hmm. this one. Yeah. You know Get that great line with like "follow me, you dum dum," but like, eh, that's a, a, a very thin thing to hang on to. Yeah. So, so yeah, I I agree that it's 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 strange to say because it's such a pretty episode, but it's not a like one of the best or strongest examples. It's not one that if I were to introduce somebody to the show for the first time, I wouldn't point them at that one. Right. Right. And I mean, again, we're not just laying into David Wise here because he writes some some pretty good ones later on. But also, this is only his second Transformers episode. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, give the guy some time to find his footing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, the show is still relatively young. So, like, really understanding the show's aboutness, I don't, I wouldn't expect with that many different players in the room and with it being developed so quickly, as somebody who's, like, made a lot of, creative projects like i often don't really know what it is until i'm like two-thirds of the way through you mm-hmm. know so like i i can imagine how difficult it would be with that many different players in the room to like really establish like what's the core aboutness of this thing like you have to be pretty far in before that starts to reveal itself you know mm-hmm. i mean so, the way this was set up it's amazing that we got great episodes out of season two as is considering you know what a rush to get things done it was and everything so mm-hmm. i mean the fact that we got some great episodes, we're really lucky. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But but a shocking and disappointing fact that I learned on the TF Wiki about this episode. Oh. I don't know if you're even aware of this, but this is Skyfire's last speaking role. Oh, no. And we may not even see him at all again, except for maybe in a couple like background shots. Oh, so now no. Skyfire is pretty much gone, which is oh, very weird know. to think about because, I mean, basically he's the only way the Autobots get anywhere. Well, until another big guy shows up, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Now I know how you felt about Reflector not <laughs> being in the show anymore. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Like, this is the last time I get to see Skyfire do stuff? Yeah, that really oh. surprised me. It didn't. It didn't seem like this happened so soon. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't like that at all. Yeah. And for his last appearance to be in this one. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, at least he goes out as square as he came in. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thanks for bumming me out at the end of this one. Yeah. <laughs> I had to bring you down to the levels that I've been at this whole time. <laughs> Welcome to my world. There was Dave of the Machines. Whew. Okay. I think we did a lot of careful examination in that one, and I think we came out on the other side with a broader and yet deeper understanding of the Transformers franchise and why we love it the way we do. So 
What do we got next week? Next up is Enter the Nightbird. And if you want uh-huh. to find that on Tubi, it's in season two. They have it as episode six. So everybody's homework is go watch Enter the Nightbird and then show up ready to let us know what you thought about it. And how can you, how can they let us know what they thought about it, Hoover? Well, we've got a Facebook group. We've got an email address. They'll all be listed at the end of the show when you hear that cool music come on. So just follow your way there, and we will love to hear from you. Hardly anyone ever gives us any email or support online. <laughs> so, I mean, we certainly do have a handful of good fans and I'm very glad to have them. Yeah. And you know who you are if you've said more than three words to us. But if you haven't said more than three words to us, why don't you? Yep. Give us a ring. Let us know. What did you like about this episode? Or if you want to chime in and say, Hoover, you were right, that it was just a bunch of unnecessary punching. Or if, if there's a composition that you noticed that you thought was really good that we should look at, do a still store and send it to us four million years later at gmail.com. All right. Well, until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. I guess I've been Day of the Hoover. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mihalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later.com, and if you haven't yet, Please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>